Okay, so it looks like the last time I had this on, I had the headpiece on. And I just did a test outside of Zoom on the camera on the computer to check the sound. And I don't think that it works, the transitions work so well in Zoom. That was my comment on the other one. Now I'm just going to try that. I will now try to change my settings from the headphone to the speaker and I'll do the same thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And uh, hopefully you can hear me just as well because I didn't notice any difference when I changed on the test that I did on my camera on the computer. So this is something I need to clarify and I don't mind investing in another microphone because if that's what I need to do what I want to do, that's okay. I'm learning to live in an abundance mindset. Now should I check this before I go forward? I'm living in faith. I'm doing lesson number eight from thinking into results and the word is belief which to me translates very much into faith and I don't know exactly what my message is right now except that I feel the desire to record and to communicate because I'm going to make a commitment. I am making a commitment. I have made a commitment. I will be recording live and posting live. Now this is not a live because I don't like my background for sharing. I can show you the two different versions, the real background and the virtual background by editing together the two videos. But I prefer my Zoom background, but you can see it's a little bit wobbly and so maybe I will also invest in my green screen so that I get a smoother background hopefully. Now the camera looks really close, but oh, I think actually there's a setting there as well. Can I change the zoom in and out? That was the light. The light just went on. Now I don't. Oh, that's a different light now. I don't know how I can. I don't know how the settings on the camera work. Okay, so these are my lessons that I'm learning. I'm learning by doing. That's my motto, and. I just read an invitation which was directed at youth and I did not feel that it meant that I'm excluded because it, the terminology in these circles when we address youth is youth is a state of mind and I definitely fall into that category. And yet when I reflect on my presentation on Monday, I had the urge, the desire, the need to share about my experiences a long time ago, more than half my lifetime ago when I was 30 years old, when I organized the Interdisciplinary Approaches to Peace Conference at Corelban Valley in Queensland. We had over 45 speakers. The topics ranged from peace in the individual to peace in the family, peace in the society, peace in the nation and peace in the world. And it was exhilarating for me to organize that conference and to participate in it. The year before, I had filmed the first national conference on interdisciplinary approaches to peace by the Professors World Peace Academy in Australia at Sydney University. And this second conference, I had the honor and privilege of organizing the whole thing together with John Dorofsky, the Secretary General of PWPA in Oceania at that time. And we followed, I was actually looking for, it looks like I'd, I don't know whether I have the draft invitation to that particular conference because I do remember that I used the Confucius quotation about peace in the individual leading to peace in the family, the society, the nation and the world. And I remember the format of the leaflet where we were inviting people to participate. It had this type of format. Oops, the 
you can't see it because of the background. Okay, so I'm going to have to maybe either do this again with photos or no, the photos don't come up very well. These, these documents are over 30 years old, but I remember at that time I printed this stuff on in A5 format. In other words, on an A4 sheet of paper with two pages per sheet and use the booklet format. Wow, how exciting. I learned how to make a book. And then we got the long um, stapler and we stapled them and we actually made booklets. So then after that, I was actually involved politically as well. And I was the secretary of the National Party and vice president as well. I was asked to stand for president, but because of my affiliations with the church, I didn't think it would do the party much good. So I declined and I was vice president. And we started, George and I, George Lemon and I started publishing reports about our events. We were very, very active with the young nationals in Canberra and actually on the national level as well in New South Wales. And what I've been reminiscing about is, oh, I wish I, I had a digital camera at that time and all of the things I could have shared with you on Facebook and in social media. We didn't even have internet in those days. And when I see what people are sharing today, I, I wish I even had just a nice color photo of where I was and what I was doing or a bit of decent video footage of some of that stuff. So the first conference, I filmed the whole conference. And the second one, which I organized, I had a team of film people who were filming the whole conference. And now I think I'd like to get copies. Ian Derbyshire, I'd like to get copies of the first conference and the second conference, 1982, 1983, 1984. Sydney and Coralbin Valley in Queensland. And actually, I also filmed Kevin McCarthy's 40 day workshop up in Queensland. And yeah, I'd like copies of those videos too, please. That's when I started getting other people like Roger Weatherall. I remember Roger when you started filming. I was the expert and I was letting go of the reins and allowing the younger people to take over. And now when I see Roger's been responsible for International Association for Economics and Development in America, and Karen Smith is providing seminars and workshops and has published books and giving training to people all over the world. I'm grateful for all we've experienced. I'm doing my memoirs, can you tell? I'm reminiscing and looking for subject matter material resources that I can share, recognizing that I can contribute a lot to reconstructing our biography, our story. We need to tell our stories. We need to write our memoirs. We unificationists, I'm talking to we unificationists, the missionaries who joined the unification movement in the 60s, 70s and 80s, even 90s. By the 90s, I was already here in Europe. When I think I consider myself a founding member of the Unification Church in Australia and when I think of how I revamped the whole headquarters procedures, Yes, I, I do want to tell that story. I really do. And I think, yeah, now the members in Australia, especially the younger members, they don't even know who I am or what I've done. And while I've been here longer in Europe than I have in Australia, and yet those roots in Australia, you know, I was the city leader in Canberra, and Chris Olsen asked me to come to the headquarters in Melbourne. And at that time, due to the conflict of the two missions between Melbourne and Sydney, between Germany and England, the headquarters after the science conference in 1977, Father Moon asked the two missionaries to come together 
for the church headquarters to come to Melbourne. And Carl Redmond, who was the missionary from England and the national leader on the Sydney side of the movement, to come to Melbourne to become the national leader. That was November 1977. And I believe after that, I don't remember whether it was that time that Chris could not return to Australia. There was a time once when he went to America and he couldn't come back and he, he went back to New Zealand instead because he couldn't get a visa for Australia. Anyhow, he called me to be in headquarters in Melbourne and at that time Kurt Cheed was also asked to stay in America to assist the American movement. And at that time the accounting was a money tin, okay? We had members fundraising all across Australia and all of the fundraising teams had to send their money into headquarters in Melbourne. And I was getting all of the reports and had to reimburse the members in each of the cities and the fundraising teams in the various states. And I, we had a printing company at that time, One World Enterprise, one World Enterprises, yeah, that's what it was called. It started off as a printing company and we were then also um, selling, importing ginseng, established as an import-export company, I guess. And then we went into health products and manufacturing massage sandals. I think of everyone there. I think of all of you. If any of you get to watch this, please get in touch. I'd really like to, to share a lot more. Maybe some of you don't want your names mentioned in public because I fully intend to make this public. It's history. It's my history. It's my story. And if you don't want your name public, that's okay. Let me know. Anyhow, um, the I remember I designed forms for the accounting and I separated the money box. We had the church accounts and we had business accounts and actually we had four registered institutions. I'm a founding member of Freedom Leadership Foundation, Family Federation for World Peace and Unification, Holy Spirit Association for Unification of World Christianity and One World Enterprises. So Holy Spirit Association for Unification of World Christianity was the church, a non-profit organization, limited company. One World Enterprises was the for-profit company. And of course, we were all the same people and all connected, but it's typical of what actually happens in the Catholic Church and in a lot of religious organizations where they set up a company, a business, and they have their charitable activities. So HSA, UWC, Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity, was actually registered in New South Wales as a charity. In Victoria, it was a different type of registration. You can see how even in this one country, you know, the time the population of Australia was about 13 million, so it wasn't, I wouldn't call it a big country, but geographically, of course, it's gigantic. And our membership was maybe 40, 45. I think that's estimated high. When I joined, I was the 21st member of those that are still there. It's probably under 10 now. Where was I? Okay, the accounting. So I separated the accounting into the business and the church. So all the fundraising money came into the church account because we had the business already running, selling the ginseng. And as I said, all of the money came to us in headquarters. And there wasn't even a clear division amongst the states. So I set up separate accounting systems, bookkeeping for each state and for church and company, church and business. I was a signatory on all of those accounts. There's another story about how I disappeared for seven days and then they took me off all of the accounts. There was almost a million dollars in the accounts 
when you take them all together and I had access to all of them and I disappeared for seven days. I went to our log cabin in the countryside with my Bible and my Divine Principle book and I was prepared to do a seven day fast but my family came to support me. My brother who's now a Catholic priest went fishing in the local dam and brought me some fish. So we had we shared some fish together and I did not fast for the seven days but I read through all of the divine principle and checked up on all of the Bible verses and marked them all in my Bible. And also read another book that my older brother gave me. Ron, you gave me the book, uh, A Severe Mercy, which fascinated me also. So actually I didn't tell anybody in the church where I was at the time and there was quite a, it was quite a drama because I had disappeared. So when I came back, as I said, I had lost all access to all of the accounts. That's not the story I was going to tell you. I was going to tell you how great I was because I set up the uh, the division, the church and the business accounts and the headquarters from the state. So then the members could send in their reports and they gave me, they had to send in all of the receipts for all of their expenses and they would then get reimbursed for their expenses. So we had an impress. We had a fixed amount of petty cash, a fixed amount of cash on the account and that was their living expenses and so from their expenses they had to keep clear records and send me all of their receipts and for the money, for the receipts that they had, I would reimburse them. And so we had a stable impress and all of the excess, all of the fundraising money that they sent us went into our church account to support the church activities and they had to wait until we reimbursed them for their own living expenses and this is where I saw things had not been running very smoothly before because the reimbursements were taking too long, headquarters was taking too long and my intention and desire and I believe I achieved it before I disappeared, I don't remember how much, I'll have to look in my diary to see when that actually was. Wow, this history, this is, well, you guys, the history of our movement, it's ups and downs, it's people sacrificing, it's drama and investment, and it's real life missionary activities. And do I really want to share this? Yeah, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm at. I want to read the testimonies of the unificationists, the books that are already available. And I want to tell my own story. And actually, I was working on something completely different before. So I just felt the need to post something. And this is what I'm thinking about posting. So let's see if I get to write anything about it as well. But those who are subscribed to my YouTube channel, did you learn anything today? Do you want me to continue? Please subscribe. Click on subscribe and share my views and let's get a conversation going. Okay? Till next time.